why I believe everyone here and everyone in the world, actually, is born for breakthrough, can break through any barrier, no matter how challenging and how gnarly and difficult it is, but only if we know how to master our own biology. So this story I'm going to uh, tell you starts about 15 years ago when I had just come out of this place, number 10 Downing Street, with my then business partner. And in the material world, I had everything you could imagine there was to offer. I had a fast-growing company. I was in The Guardian and The Times and the FT as a young entrepreneur. I was 28. Um, I was a multimillionaire on paper. And for some reason, I um, found it particularly exciting that I had lots of gold airline uh, loyalty cards. I was flying around the world. It seemed to be a big thing at the time. What I didn't have was inner peace. I didn't have an organization or a company built around my deepest purpose. I didn't have my leadership potential uh, as an agent of change in the world um, at its best. And in fact, about a year after this photo was taken, when I had a thriving business uh, in central London, working all over the world, everything crumbled, and I engaged in a full entrepreneurial burnout experience. And that burnout brought all the depression that I'd suffered uh, since a teenager back. Um, I got a flare-up of a condition I'd been diagnosed with called fibromyalgia, um, where every movement was agony. And I decided at that point, I made a full commitment to do whatever it took to never experience that again. And it's what I now call a bifurcation point. I had a choice whether to take a high road or a low road, the low road of further breakdown, not dealing with what was really going on for me deep within, or to see if I could master this process of transformation that I now call breakthrough. And so I decided to do whatever it took to do that. And I'd had already had a degree in medical science. I wanted to be a psychiatrist um, as an early, um, in my early 20s. I'd had six years of therapy by then. I'd studied philosophy uh, in quite some depth. And I knew that I had pretty much the best education money can buy in the West. And in all that time, I'd never been taught, even for one hour, how to master myself, how to understand my own emotions, my thoughts, and my behaviors. So that was 13, 14 years ago. I went on the path of breakthrough. And before I continue, I want to make this live for you as much as it is for me out here on the red spot. And to ask you right now, go live and direct into your life, into your world, what breakthrough do you want today? Whether it's in your life, in your relationships, in your community, in your organization, or in our world. Whatever um, level of the system that you are brought to in this moment, what does your truth say to you about what you want to break through today? And so that for the rest of this short talk, I'm going to invite you to hold that with you and see if anything that I share might open up some space for your own breakthrough. So the reason why breakthroughs are so important is because the way the world is today is very different from how it was two or 300 years ago. You may have heard the term VUCA. It's a US military term originally. And I've added a little bit to it to try and encapsulate why the world needs us to break through. So VUCA stands for <clears throat> volatile, as in the world is likely to change, usually for the worse. It's uncertain. We can't see around the corner. We can't see what's going to happen in a month, let alone a year or five years. And the news plays that out regularly. It's complex. There are connections between things that we can't always understand. It's ambiguous. The same thing that you see means something different to me. I see uh, it as exciting. You see it as terrifying. Data can be taken and made into all sorts of different stories. It's also networked. <clears throat> There are connections between people, places, and products, things that have never been uh, existed in the whole history of the human species. And perhaps most importantly, it's stressed. Our ecosystems are stressed. Our economies are stressed. Our governments are stressed. Our companies are stressed. And perhaps above all, most importantly, we are stressed 
Depression is now the number one cause of ill health in the world. Suicide kills more than war and murder put together every year. So in this reality of constant change, we have a choice to make because everything we do, every product that we sell as a company, every service we provide as an organization, every way we lead people, every way we talk in our relationships is either forging the future and becoming more relevant or it's failing it and becoming less relevant. So we have this choice. Do we learn how to increasingly forge the future in whatever level that means? Whether it's taking our families on a journey of transformation away from how they used to be in the 50s or our organizations that are running uh, business models from the 80s that just are not working today. Because the most easy way for me to explain this is if you use the dating habits, the dating beliefs, the dating emotions you had when you were 13 or 14 years old to find a conscious, intimate, committed relationship when you're 35, it's probably going to be a fail. And that's the same for all the models we use to run every organization on the planet. If you're using old models, which most organizations are, then you're going to start to feel them fail, and that failure will show up in all sorts of interesting different ways. It will show up in products that don't seem to work. It will show in staff not wanting to be there or not being engaged when they are there. And so we have this choice. So the question is then, why is it so challenging? Why can't we just go, OK, our model's not working. The way I'm at leading these people is not relevant anymore. The way I'm talking to my loved one doesn't seem to be creating a nourishing family environment. So I'm just going to change it. And that is, for me, the great question of the human experience. I'm going to give you a tiny example of how powerful this challenge is and how deep this challenge is. This is a six-letter uh, anagram. I'd like you to put your hand up. Don't say anything. Put your hand up when you have done it. So two. That's actually three. Thank you very much. That's actually a, uh, probably a record uh, as a percentage of the room. I've shown this to maybe 50,000 of possibly the, some of the smartest people in the world, including people at Yale, at Oxford, um, very large companies, and only a handful have ever got it. The answer is, of course, cubism for those who, three of you. For the rest of us, we're probably going, be music, be music, be music, mm, be music. Mm, 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 mm. And this is the heart of our biology. We have an answer which isn't right. We know it's not brilliant, but it's the best we've got. And so we just keep saying it, be music, be music. I wonder what it could be, be music. So the question is, what's going on in here? Or rather, in here and here, because I don't believe the mind is just in the brain. And latest research shows that our mind and our body are totally interlinked. They're one thing. We feel with our um, heads uh, as much as we do with our hearts. So what are we doing? What's going on in here during this moment? So a breakthrough came in 2012 when a team put some of these guys, some rappers, into an fMRI scanner. An fMRI scanner basically um, monitors changing activity in the brain. And they asked these rappers to do two different things. One was to share or perform lyrics they'd already written, so performing live. And the other was to totally improvise in the moment, which is about as close as we can get to the pure moment of creativity, a pure moment of the the raw material we need most to have a breakthrough, creative change. And what they found was deeply fascinating. They found that the part of our brain that we associate with being smart was actually less active during improvisation than it was during uh, the moments when we're usually active and smart. So we're actually less smart when we're creating than we are when we're doing other things. And this may already give us a glimpse of why so many organizations don't change in time for them to stay healthy, because they're full of really smart people who are paid to be smart. 
And since then, in the last few years, there have been a number of uh, more studies. There's been a, a rash of, of science about this part of our brain, how our brain works. And this is a summary of what the picture is. This is basically as, as fresh as you're going to get it. It seems like we have two fundamental networks in our brain. So we used to think of the brain as modules. Now people think of it as networks. So we have this. It's called the cognitive control network. It kind of does what it says on the tin. It's about control and certainty. And then we have this other network called the default mode network, which before a few years ago, no one had any clue existed. And in fact, neuroscientists believe that if we're not focused on something, our brain is inactive. That's not true. When we're not focused on something, our default mode network operates. It's also called the daydreaming network. It's the network that we use when we are creating, when we are thinking new thoughts. And in fact, Franz Kafka, the novelist, I read recently in a biography of his, one of the most inventive novelists in the history of the world, used to spend up to eight hours a day lying down on the floor daydreaming. And I ask you, myself, how many of us would get uh, encouraged to do that at work? Right? So that's uh, the two networks. And so in control mode, we're really good at solving familiar problems. We've know that we worked how to do this, done it before, just do it again. So it's, a, it's the realm of best practice. This is how we do things around here. This is the right way to do things. This is the safe way to do things. This is the smart way to do things. And it's really powerful, but when it's an extreme, it tends toward organizations and families and communities that are perfectionist. Got to find the right way. Rather than maybe the, the most appropriate way, or the way that's going to fit the future, got to find the right way. And then we have this other mode, create and connect mode, which is about new problems we've never, ever seen before. And so our ability to use this uh, daydreaming uh, mode that's allowed us to be here in this room because it's the thing that's been able, allowed us to be able to create new ways in, with problems that we've never solved before. So this is the realm of breakthroughs. This is the realm of creating with change rather than trying to stop change happening. And the key thing about this model is there's a third network called the salience network, which is rooted down in the emotion parts of our brain. And so what scientists have discovered is that the, what determines the mode we're in, whether it's control and protect, or whether it's create and connect, is our emotions. Now this makes perfect sense, because if you imagine that we've evolved to do really one thing first, get out of the way of this stuff. And if you this coming, a tiger coming towards you and you're going, hold on a minute, I'm going to daydream and think of a crazy breakthrough. We're going to have a disruptive innovation. It's going to be awesome. Just wait a minute. You're dead. So our system, our biology, has been very smart. It said, OK, the priority number one is survival for tomorrow. Then, if you're still around, we can have you thriving, have you creating. Brilliant system. So if we feel emotions like these, then we are wired to go into control and protect mode. If we experience emotions like these, we open our hearts, we open our minds, we open our eyes, and we go into create and connect mode. This is just how we are wired. Now have a look at this list of emotions and think to yourself, how much does my family, whoever you live with, flatmates, partners, children, parents, how much do you spend in the emotions of control and protect, and how much do you spend in the emotions of create and connect? And now think about your organization. How much do you spend on the right, and how much do you spend on the left? And there's no better or worse. They're both really valuable. We want both. But we want to be able to know how to consciously choose which mode we're in to fit the moment. So if you want to make a cup of tea, there's no need to spend a lot of cognitive, creative effort on it. But if we want to speak to our children in a new way, when they trigger us with something that's really challenging, we might just want to stop a moment and get out of control and protect and invent the future with them. And this is particularly powerful in organizations, where I spend a lot of my time helping them understand how to stop doing the same thing over and over again, expecting it to work better in 2018 than it did in 1983. And it means getting people into create and connect. 
And beautifully, we now have some evidence about how powerful this is. Google, one of the world's most innovative companies, spent over 10 years studying with social sciences what makes the best teams. They studied over 100 teams, and they couldn't work it out for year after year. It wasn't smarts. It wasn't the usual performance coaching. It wasn't all these things. They were all not giving us the truth until they came across one thing which psychologists call psychological safety. Connection. Feeling okay to risk new thoughts, to be vulnerable, to experiment, to have new ideas without being shamed and without being told off, without being told that's not how we do things around here. Are you crazy? So the question all our lives are based upon is how do we learn how to let go of this, the thing that's in our mind that's stopping us have the new idea? Because the great tragic comedy of the human experience is that we have to let go of the old before we get the new. And all of us would love to have the new before we have to let go of the old. We want the new boyfriend before we let go of the old one. We want the new business model that's creating loads of profit and growth in our stock price before we let go of the old one. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that's just not how it works. So what it all becomes about in these crazy times that we're in, and I think we can all agree the times are pretty strange, interesting, as the Chinese might say, is to be able to know how to switch out of this default mode that we've been in probably for years, since we were very young and first experienced threats and concerns and anxiety, and choose in the moments we need to how to get into this place in our lives. And that's what I learned in the last 13, 14 years since this photo was taken. I gave up that company. I gave up those millions. Literally chose not to go there, not to sign the company away, not to work further in that work. And I learned how to reinvent myself over and over and over again and let go of more and more and more until there was nothing left to, f to give me fear in the middle of the night or in the middle of a fight because that's when it's mo the moment's right to switch on. And through that experience, I discovered on my hero's journey, uh, my boon, my gift, was what I've now since become the switch on way, which is a way of essentially turning any pain, no matter how gnarly and difficult and scary it is, into potential, into possibility. And I'm going to invite you to engage in three questions now with the thing, the problem, the pain that you want to break through, the beginning of the switch on way. The first is what habit, belief, or feeling is getting in the way of your thriving as a business, as a leader in your life? See if you can see what it is without shame, without blame, without complaint. What would be possible for you if you let go of this? What would be possible for your organization? What would be possible for our world if you could let go of this habit, this pattern, this belief, this mood? And then the ultimate question is, can you feel connected enough, safe enough right now to let go of it? And if you can't, then that's the time to go deeper. Thank you very much.